Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Sverrefen Nordic Pavilion Venice, uh, Voices from the Archives, edited by Mary Lending and Eric Landalen and published by Pax for Lag in collaboration with Lars Müller. In the spring of 2018, rumors were that the concrete in the Nordic Pavilion in Venice was crumbling and that the pavilion might be closed during the 2020 Architecture Biennale for restoration work. We even heard that a Finnish architect had suggested to replace the concrete roof construction with a wooden replica. This interesting piece of information called for action. Two ideas immediately sprang to mind. One was to propose ourselves as the curators for the 2020 Biennale and turn the pavilion during restoration into a work in its own right. Architecturally unrivaled among the pavilions in the Giardini, the Nordic pavilion has proven to be a difficult exhibition space, and a reluctance to intervene in the overpowering space has long since become a topos among artists, architects and curators. Addressing questions on how to restore a modern monument, we considered it a typical issue to display the building as a construction site, with the fiberglass roof torn off and the floor cleared, to give an in-depth view into the beloved atavistic structure, while displaying its full archive in the storeroom. That idea we did not pursue. Instead, we turned to the archival evidence in view of the physical ones. Contrary to what we had heard prior to scrutinizing the Winter Closed Pavilion in March 2019, the concrete seemed to be fine, although rain was pouring through cracks in the roof. At the time, we had started looking into the history of the pavilion, from the early discussions of a Nordic cooperation in Venice to the concrete aggregates, from post-war geopolitics to every minute matter of its making. In the spring of 2019, we ran a graduate seminar in Oslo on the material history of the pavilion, which led to the excavation of thousands of documents in archives in Venice, Milan, Copenhagen, Helsinki, Stockholm and Oslo. While the historiography of the Nordic pavilion has paid no attention to the archives, we have encountered that odd phenomenon by writing the history of its making and its architectural fundamentals almost exclusively from archival documents. From the archives, a different story emerges than the one handed down in the pavilion's whimsical, poetical and phenomenologically saturated reception history, in which Zverefen himself played a central part. One sees more clearly the bold modernism of the young architect who had achieved some international repute for his Norwegian pavilion at the 1958 Brussels World's Fair. The archives also reveal Fenn's uncompromising will to experiment with materials, many of which he had little or no experience as to how they would behave. The life of the Nordic pavilion is the story of an unruly little structure, where not much worked according to plan. Most of the trees immediately died, and the floor and the roof have been a constant headache. Perhaps these problems partly explain its captivating attraction also as a historical object. Yet, this is not first and foremost a book about the great architect Zverefen. The Nordic Pavilion offers a rare prism into the ambitions of what the Biennale executives refer to as uh, the Zeta Nordic in an increasingly tense Cold War atmosphere. The building was the result of a collaborative effort involving a vast cast spanning from kings, politicians, diplomats and bureaucrats to engineers, gardeners and plumbers. Our aim has been to bring back to life the polyphony of the voices involved, many of which reside today in the shadow of mainstream historiography. We document the successes but also the disappointments involved in the Nordic country's Venetian initiative. We introduced this volume with fans' photographs taken during his site visit in September 1959, documenting in close-ups an impenetrable growth of trees, shrubs and weeds, while trying to make sense of a site most of those involved considered nearly unbuildable. 
Three months later, he submitted the competition entry for a Pavillon Nordique Avenues. As an overture, we have also translated the unedited minutes uh, from the second meeting of the Building Committee for a Nordic Pavilion in Venice. Most of the issues that arose during construction were anticipated in this meeting that took place in Oslo in December 1960. This document, with its uh, hand-scribed edits, evokes uh, any meeting most of us uh, regularly attend. Cacophonic, characterized by incomplete sentences and interruptions, and it is as such extremely realistic in its apparent absurdities. In this meeting, Fenn expressed worries about uh, the difficulties of translating the precise vocabularies of architecture and engineering back and forth between Italian and the Nordic languages. That is a sentiment we share, and in our case, not only of translating the idioms and idiosyncrasies of the Nordic languages into English, but also in time. Originally, the English language plays no part in this story. French was at the time not only the language of diplomacy, but also the de facto lingua franca. Fenn, for instance, having worked with Jean Prouvé in Paris in the early 1950s, was, as most of his educated European contemporaries at the time, familiar with French or German, not with English. To us, it has been something of a time travel experience reading these documents of the 1950s and 60s, acknowledging the historicity and changes in the Nordic languages, also in regard to the names of institutions, professional titles and artists' associations, and their time-typical connotations that are sadly lost when translated into English. The historicity of a concrete object presents the institutional origins of the Nordic pavilion. Fenn aimed the, not at making a batimon, but a continuous plane for the exhibition of contemporary art, an architecture that renders art with the greatest possible autonomy, as he beautifully put it. We have zoomed in on the elements that Fenn harnessed to liberate art from architecture, and present in three dedicated chapters the trees, the floor and the roof as a combined building and archival archaeology. Writing this book has felt like an exercise in restraint. We have tied ourselves firmly to the mast and directed our efforts to the overlooked facts, archival accounts, documents and images, ignoring the temptation to interpret and elaborate both obvious and lesser-known parts of the context. The object and its uh, dispersed archives have defined our myopic focal point. The Venetian photographic firm Ferruzzi's images of the pavilion from April 1962, taken less than two months uh, before its dedication, and their series of photos from the installation of the first exhibition in June, conclude our micro-historical encounter with the thing itself. Additionally, we have invited colleagues to write short pieces on specific aspects of the little structure. The book was designed by Asla Gurholt and uh, Martinez Bjornsen. Visit the pavilion when you're in Venice and ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for joining me today and see you in the next video.